Welcome everyone to the Squad Showcase for October of 2020. This is our end of month monthly show and tell of the collaborative work that's been going on around the community. What are squads? Quick reminder, squads are groups of individuals from implementations, organizations, other groups, or volunteers from all over the world working on specific solutions to shared problems. And if you're interested in joining any of the work that's mentioned today, each of the squads will be introducing uh, their key contacts as well as some links in these slides where you can learn more. Quick mention about community support. There are a number of us supported either through uh, OpenMRS Inc or other mechanisms to uh, help make this happen. Reach out to any of us if you have any further questions. And finally, I would like everyone uh, joining today to know about our survey. We would love to hear about how you found this experience. We'll post the link to uh, the survey in the chat, but you have the opportunity to vote for the best demo that was given in this showcase. Please vote for the demo of the month and that uh, squad will receive fame and recognition on talk. Some uh, quick reminders, if you are presenting today, please be very mindful of time. There's about five to 10 minutes per squad. We have been trying to take questions at the end, but almost never get there. So I'll address questions in a moment. Um, and please presenters help us visually see the big picture, show us why something is useful and how people can start using it. If you are here joining today, please share the love. Use the reactions in the participants uh, list in Zoom to let us know what work is exciting to you. And if you have any feedback whatsoever, whether it's good job or uh, a question, we would really love to hear from you on the Zoom chat. So once again, share your questions in the Zoom chat. All right, the first announcement is about the conference. Uh, would uh, Jen, would someone like to speak about this briefly? Hi, Grace, I can tackle that. Please. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, so we'll be having our 14th annual conference, which will be our first ever virtual conference. So we are welcoming all of you to join us for this year's conference and hoping to have a very large attendance. Our, our theme in this year's conference is working together to solve emerging health challenges, and it will be on that year to 4th December. So we have a link to our wiki page, which is already up. And um, a quick, quick updates that are important. Please, the next slide, Grace. So we have registrations are open and uh, this, year's we have, this year we have a different mechanism. So we are requesting people to pay as they wish given it's a virtual conference and we'd still like to keep it as cost neutral as possible. And so we have four uh, different options under which you can be able to do that. We have uh, $25, 50, 75 and $100, which include a t-shirt. Please take note that the t you may not be able to get the t-shirt before the conference. However, you will definitely get your t-shirt. So I have put in the links to the register and how, how you can make a payment. And of course, I'll also put, post that on the chat window as well. Second thing is that we have our OpenMRS banner, uh, some options up. So if you could also just have a look at that. And additionally, we normally have when uh, committee members like to submit uh, designs after they've seen other designs, you're welcome to do so. And I've put in that deadline. So just do so by 2nd November so that we can get to vote and comment on that. And there's definitely also uh, a delay to the top post on where you can do that. The other thing that is really major is our conference schedule. So we are, so based on our theme, we are planning our conference around um, having um, having some very key uh, plenary sessions. I've put some of the ideas that we have on the, as you can see, we have cross-border collaboration, open mass capacity building, and voices from squads and teams. If you feel there's any other that you'd really like to see as a plenary discussion, please let us know. Also, we'll be setting up how we can do one conferencing sessions uh, before and during the conference. So if you also have any ideas on that, you're very much welcome. And also let us know what else you would like to see uh, during our conference. We have a few things that we're trying to come to think about, like a virtual site visit, and of course, um, how we could easily be able to do like a social hour within uh, virtually. So if you have any input, please uh, click on the link that you'll be able to get there. And that's all I have for today. Please join us every Tuesday at, uh, I believe it's 3 p.m. UTC to contribute to planning for the conference. Thank you, Chris. Over Thanks, to you. Christy. Great. Okay, and now over to the micro front end squad. They were our winner of demo of the month last month. Let's see what they have for us today. So 
So um, a quick background to the micro front end squad. If you can imagine that you were able to rapidly reuse front end modules that other teams had created, well, Grace, that sounds scary. Well, what if you could implement those right away without being afraid that those modules would cause breakages elsewhere? So to solve these problems, we have a new UI framework for OpenMRS that leverages modern JavaScript frameworks for harnessing microservice architecture. But let's see what they've actually done in the last month. One of uh, their main goals has been plug and play tools for developers and new designs for the patient visit workflow. It's worth highlighting that the plug and play tools for developers that you are about to see can be used even regardless of using the new UI, as long as a solution chooses to um, factor their front end using the micro front end architecture, which this squad is happy to support people with if they would like any, uh, any support with that. So I'm gonna start with a quick demo from Brandon here that's going to show some of the progress in the plug and play tools. Hi, this is Brandon, and I'd like to demonstrate a couple new features of the OpenMRS Implementer tool. So I've got a version of the home page loaded here, which has all the buttons as extensions. If I open up the Implementer tools, now under the home page app, I can see that the extension configuration is actually editable here in the Implementer tools. The other big improvement is that changes to the implementer tools and changes to the config here in the implementer tools are reflected live. So if I add a reports link to the remove array, the link immediately disappears. Okay, thanks, Brandon. I uh, will just get the next video queued up. The next video shows the progress with uh, drug ordering. And it would help if I turned the volume on. Grace, we're not seeing or hearing anything. Ah, thank you. It would also help if I resumed sharing my screen and my volume. Okay. Hello, my name is Manuel Römer and I'm from the Smartpiot slash Microfront and Dev Squad team. And um, I'm going to present you the, the work which has been done on the medication order entry widget in the patient chart. This is basically the work that we've been, been doing over the past few weeks. And I guess at this point we have, have a lot of results to show. So in general, it is about um, displaying and ordering the medications which are assigned to a patient. As you can see, for example, we are right now in James Smith patient chart. And as you can see already here, we have a lot of, of orders of medications which the patient should well, take or buy at some point in time. Um, we have implemented a way to display active medications and past medications. So we have the whole medications history. And of course, also a way to, to order and to add new medications. Um, this can be done via the order basket, which is new right now. And this is basically a traditional order basket like, like on Amazon, for example, just that it's tailored for medications and for drugs. Um, for example, let's say that we want to, to order a drug called sulfadoxin for the, the patient. It is as simple as just typing or basically searching for, for the drug. And then you're already presented with a lot of results which are relevant. And as you can see, we have different dosages, we have different um, ways to, to take in the medication. And all of these can basically be configured for the patient. Now, from the point of the user perspective, um, it is basically a pre-configured drug which can immediately be ordered. And for example, if we, add, or if we click on this button here, the drug directly gets added to the basket. Um, now, let's say that we want to edit this drug. Let's say that we want to, to add some, some patient instructions on how the patient should take the drug. Then we can click on it, and we can basically get navigated to this order input form. We can configure a lot of additional 
information. For example, change the dosage if we, if we click the wrong item. And with that being done, we can save the drug again. It's still in the basket and we can order it. And now the, the medication is added to the basket. Why doesn't it appear here? Because the medication didn't have a duration. If we, for example, let's want to want to say that a patient has to take a drug for one week, we can also do that by a medication form. In this example, we also show how to modify a drug. So currently the patient is taking aspirin uh, at the moment for three days. So let's say we want to modify that. We modify it, it gets added to the basket, not as a new item, but as a modified item. We click it, get it taken to the same form again. And now let's say we want to modify the duration. Let's put it up to, to seven days, so save it, and that drug, as you can see, um, started on the 29th, well, here. Um, so it is still active, so to say. So if we save it, the drug is still appearing under the active medications. Now, um, it is also important that we can discontinue medication, for example, well, <laughs> if the patient doesn't have to take it anymore. This is also possible. Um, for active medications, we just click on this button, say discontinue, the, uh, the, the medication gets added as a discontinued action to our basket, and then once you click save, the medication will no longer be active. Now let's say that this was a mistake and we want to, to um, continue taking this medication. Well, there's also the possibility to reorder past medication. So we click on a past medication which is no longer active, click reorder. As you can see, it already appears in the basket. And once we sign this, medication is active again and basically ordered from this day on for five days. Right. It is also possible to basically have uh, multiple actions in the basket once. For example, we want to modify aspirin and also want to add uh, sulfur doxine. As you can see, it just stacks up over the time. And with this, I hope that we well, uh, have a good flow for, for um, entering orders and medications in the future. Um, yeah. OK, thank you to Manuel and Florian for putting that together for us. And to wrap up the micro front end squad presentation today, since we are running over time there, we're just going to wrap up with some of the uh, latest designs. So you can all see what's coming out of our UX design driven process. We'll start with the problem of how do you deal with uh, how many interruptions a staff member using an EMR probably received in a day? Here is another way that we can handle um, interrupted actions so that um, you can jump between um, orders and notes with them being um, incomplete. So if we start an order for aspirin and we choose aspirin and drop it down and now we have an indicator that there's an action that's incomplete in the floating action button and we could go in and complete the order and resolve it. Same with the notes, we can go in and start a note, drop it down. And if we, at that moment, then also opened up Aspirin, opened up the order basket and dropped that down, now we have an indicator of two interrupted actions in the floating action button. Uh, and as before, no matter where we move in the app, then the um, action button appears the same to indicate how many actions are currently unfinished at any one point. Um, and then we should just talk, talk about um, how we handle secondary actions like filling out a vital. So if we drop this down, the question would be then do we uh, show a similar indicator um, in the menu that there's an action here or do we say um, that you have to just discard your unsafe changes when you, um, when you drop this drawer down? Um, probably I would prefer that we keep the same pattern, that any time you um, re minimize a, um, a bottom sheet, that you can uh, minimize it in, in the same state and then pull it back. Um, so maybe we need an indicator here of an item that's been incomplete. Um, but I think we can discuss that more together. OK, let me know what you think about this. Thanks. And finally, we'll wrap up with the new patient visit workflow designs. Here's a quick video of, of the prototype that we'll be testing tomorrow. And I wanted to focus on a 
new concept for the um, create new patient flow based on the conversation that we just had um, in the design call earlier today. Um, if we say that it's very important for um, people to be able to jump between the different sections of this form, um, then this would be the best way to handle it. Um, so basically the form is all um, one very long form and then you have the um, the quick links menu here, uh, which you can jump you to the um, to our anchor point within the uh, within the form. So you could um, fill in the details for somebody's um, children and then jump back to fill in um, their date of birth or um, their contact uh, address and things like that. And then at the bottom of the form, then is the um, the buttons to finish uh, and. Yeah, I will drop a link to this prototype, um, which is also uh, contains all the other screens that we'll be testing in the coming days. Um, but wanted to already share that um, create new patient flow for you to see. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you, Microfriend and Squad. As a reminder, this squad does meet uh, every week on Thursday. In fact, they'll be meeting uh, at the at the end of this squad showcase to uh, review their latest work together once a week. So that's always an exciting squad call to join. Moving over to the COVID-19 squad. This squad has gone through a real genesis. I, can people hear me okay? Please uh, speak up if you cannot. This squad has gone through quite a genesis. Uh, originally, when COVID first broke out, we were setting up all kinds of things from forums and workflows and concepts to support uh, COVID patient management. Recently, we've been working on an easier to set up open MRS to DHIS to pipeline. We found uh, that, well, I'll, I'll show you what we found. Um, we have just recently completed uh, resetting up the DHIS connector module. Uh, we fixed a number of pieces here and to share with us the exciting updates and changes that have happened here and why it can make implementers lives so much easier is our former GSOC student, Jay Asenka, who has done much of this work. Let's hear what he has to say. Hello, I'm Jay Asenka. Today, I'm going to do a review on the OpenMRS DHIS2 connector module. For the sake of demo, let's assume that we have an open MRS instance in a hospital and we need to visualize COVID-19 patient data in DHIS2. Okay, now I have set up a new data set using DHIS2 to gather COVID-19 patient data. Here I have patient counts based on gender and age. I have three age groups here. There are some silly age, pardon me, just for the demo purpose. Also, I have created a new open MRS period indicator report to get the data that I need. So, the data set is to gather monthly data. If I need to visualize this data, I have to run the report at the end of each month and copy those values one by one and paste them into DHIS2. Pretty hard, huh? Here's the problem. If you have many complicated reports and numerous data sets, then the things get much worse. Here's the DHIS2 connector module that comes to the picture. This module was initially developed by GMB, then it has migrated to the OpenMRS repo. Hats off to GMB for developing this extremely useful module. Using this module, you can easily push data from OpenMRS to DHIS2. Without talking much, let's move to the module. You can install this module from the module window of OpenMRS or just follow the setup instructions on the README file. I'm going to connect the module with DHIS2 by adding the host, DHIS2 username, and password. Before sending the data, we have to create a mapping. Mapping stores the relation between OpenMRS report and the DHIS2 datasets. We have to select the OpenMRS re report from the left side and the DHIS2 dataset from the right side. This page will give you a nice drag and drop UI to do the mappings with the indicators of the report and the data elements and the category option of DHIS2. Now I have created the mapping, let's try to push some data. In the DHIS2 dashboard, I have generated some nice little charts for my dataset. As you all can see, here I don't have data for the month of September. Also, I can see it on the data entry view too. Now, let's go back to the modules run report view. Select our report and the mapping. Select the relevant open MRS location and the DHS to open it. Select the month, in this case September. 
Also, not this deep figure changed the golden period type of the data set. We are ready to go. Let's click on the send button and wait for the response. Amazing! Seems we have done it correctly. Let's go to DHI Stew and verify it. Now let's check back the month of September. Here we go. We have successfully pushed the data to DHIS2. Let's see what happened to our charts. Before that, we need to do one thing. It's updating the analytics table. Okay, let's see how it looks. Now we can see data for the month of September here. Apart from that, the module has some nice set of features. You can manage these mapping, duplicate them or delete them. Also, you can export and re-import the mapping, share them between instance, back up the DHIS2 API, so on. Another nice feature that comes with the module is the schedule option. All you have to do is schedule in the reports. The module will do the jobs for you. Thanks for watching. Hope you got an idea about the module. And the nice thing is you can also contribute to make this module far better. That's the magic of open source. If you haven't joined yet, please join the community talk.openmrs.org. Let's continue the discussion there. Goodbye. Write code. Save life. Big thanks to Jasenka for such a great video. If you would Hello, like to check I'm out Jay the Sanka. repo with our current Today, work, I'm going to do a review we on the OpenMRS DHIS2 connector oh, module. We'll also be launching this in the add-on directory. Sorry, so we have an open. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we will also be launching this in the add-ons directory very shortly. So we will be making an announcement. Hello, once it is out. I'm Jai Sankar. That video to keep wanting to play. Okay, uh, over to the Open MRS Academy Squad. Thanks, Grace. So the Open MRS Academy Squad is interested in supporting the long-term of sustainability, long-term sustainability of Open MRS products and implementations by creating Open MRS Academies that expand to local Open MRS capacity. This is an initiative that started last year at OMRS 19 in Maputo. Um, this squad currently we meet every Thursday at 3 p.m. UTC, so in just 35 minutes, um, the, this week's squad call will start. And um, the squad is primarily led by Antonio, Marina, myself, and Christine. So what have we been up to? Um, can we move to the next slide? Um, so this month, we are actually looking at 2021 and what are our potential activities? What do we really want to focus on this? Um, this month, uh, we're, we're trying to really raise awareness about OpenMRS fundamentals among leaders, new implementers, new developers, people who have little or no knowledge about OpenMRS and the community. So a, a really basic fundamental um, knowledge and skill set. And then we also want to try to arm implementers with the skills required to plan, install, and maintain OpenMRS. Um, these are the two problems we're trying to solve right now. Um, our big milestone that we just hit um, almost exactly a month ago was the OpenMRS Fundamentals Academy it was live in Maputo September, um, September 29th through October 1st. And our next steps are to really integrate that feedback from the first Fundamentals Academy and create a polished package for broader use. This may very well include um, looking at our knowledge center on the wiki and how we can make the materials available in that space in a more attractive, useful way for anybody and everybody who wants to use them. Um, right now, before I get into some of the specific feedback from the, the Academy, the Fundamentals Academy in Maputo, right now, as we start to look at the next year, we know that we are looking for content experts um, and curriculum developers who would be interested in helping the squad design training materials or contribute to the content or help facilitate sessions either remotely or in person, um, especially if we're going to focus more on like an implementers academy, um, moving from to the next set, kind of like to the next skill set, we really need developers, implementers, um, SMEs who really know their stuff to help us make this a, a quality training um, academy for anybody who, who wants to take it. And we are also looking for implementations who are willing to pilot an Implementers Academy in 2021. So 
Um, if this sounds like you, please reach out and let me know um, or join one of our squad calls. And now I'm going to share a little bit of feedback from Maputo. Can we go to the next slide? This was a really interesting uh, academy because we have, you know, the, the pandemic is changing how we had to consider delivering the academy. Um, we ended up with 13 participants representing the Ministry of Health, implementers, and university students. We had a combination of local OpenMRS implementers and OpenMRS community members who co-facilitated the sessions over the course of three days. So we had local um, facilitators um, from, from Jembi and Maputo who primarily led the first two modules on the first day and a half. And then a huge sh shout out to Ellen Ball, Andy Cantor, Matthew Smedike, and Christine and Herbert for doing remote sessions for modules three and four. They they created recordings and then we and that or they participated live um, from you know calling in through Zoom on the on the second and third day. And then we also had those local co-facilitators there to kind of support um, Q and A and make make those try to make those remote sessions a little bit more interactive. So like I said, this happened at the end of September. It was in Maputo. And some of the lessons that we learned, if you go to the next slide, um, the feedback that we heard, um, was that people thought the content was clear and relevant. Um, they, they thought the facilitators were professional, clear, concise, concise and knowledgeable. Um, unsurprisingly, there's great interest in having practical exercises and demos. Um, we really wanted to know what people thought about those pre-recorded remote sessions. Um, how did that go? And people thought it was great. And they wanted to find a way of interacting with the facilitators. How can we ask um, questions um, about, about the data model or the concept dictionary? We want to get we want to get into this a little bit more. How do we how can we find a way to interact with those facilitators? Um, there's also more interest in advanced topics like interoperability, form development, concept dictionary, and data model. Um, and those hopefully would be addressed in some of the future academies around um, implementation and development. And then we're also talking with OpenHIE to see how their OpenHIE Academy, um, how that content could complement what, um, what is being asked for here. So like I said, um, right now we're looking at what could be on the table for 2021. So we need to explore how to improve that remote asynchronous learning piece. Uh, what is the best way to package and make materials available on the wiki? Do we do an implementers academy or a developer academy? What do implementations want? What do implementations have planned? Um, and, then, and then also I think um, we're talking about uh, how, what strategies could we use to make the academy more sustainable? So do we need to train facilitators? Do we need to collaborate with universities? These are all the kinds of ideas um, that are coming up as we talk about plans for 2021. So please join us, um, reach out, and let us know if you are interested in contributing in any way. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jen. Next up, we have the Analytics Engine Squad, and I believe I'm handing it over to Alan and Bashir to share information with us about this. Uh, yes, uh, hi, uh, thanks, uh, Grace. Can you go to the next slide? So the the, the main presentation is a, is a video clip. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, Sorry, does does anyone hear me? <laughs> it's Bashir, and today I want to show you how um, we can yeah, use I, I some can of the just, uh, tools that we have developed oh, for the analytics and like you know, of <laughs> OpenMRS. <laughs> we, um, we don't, so basically I don't what see I will it, do sorry. is that, you know, I will create a test data Very set good. using the demo data. Sorry, and, yeah, uh, if you I'll export those that, to yeah. um, a Firestore yeah, oh. on. Yeah, right. if you go to the slides, actually I have embedded and then it starts from, yeah. So basically, um, sorry, can you go one slide back and then I talk for like 
20 seconds yeah so this is this is a long video that i wanted to actually include all of the features that we have so far um so but we skip part of it so it, in the next slide we start at uh, two minutes it's basically goes through the introduction and also the data generation part but we skip that and then we when we reach uh, uh, around 720 i guess we can jump another two minutes because i want to go up to 14 so uh, we can have 10 minutes so if you go to the and sorry there is some noise uh, like background noise because of my my microphone and uh, i didn't have time to fix it yeah so if you play it so yeah, what okay, i so want this to is do now it. is to use the batch pipeline to download uh, openmrs data everything in openmrs uh, like all the patient encounter and observation data in OpenMRS as fire resources, and then upload them into a fire store uh, in, uh, in the cloud, uh, which is connected to BigQuery as the data warehouse. So for doing this, this is the GCP uh, console for my project and the healthcare browser. Uh, so I have created this OpenMRS uh, demo and also in BigQuery, I have this OpenMRS demo data set, uh, which is empty, uh, as you can see here. So we have this tool under uh, Utils in the uh, OpenMRS Fire Analytics repo, which is called Create Fire Store. So this is the command that I use uh, to create a, an OpenMRS uh, um, a fire store called OpenMRS in my test data set and also uh, connected to the BigQuery data set such that any changes in this is reflected in the BigQuery uh, uh, data set as well. So let's see how this goes. Okay, and the reason that, you know, we are using the STU3 version is because uh, because of, you know, some of the reasons that I explained later that when we want to create Parquet files, we have to revert back to STU3 for now, but, you know, eventually we want to be able to support both R4 and STU3 as the fire version. So this seems to be fine, so both creation of the fire store and uh, and uh, we create BigQuery streaming is set up now. So let's have a, a look here. So inside this OpenMRS demo, now I should see, a, yeah, now I see this uh, fire um, store, which is STU3. Okay, so I am now trying to run the batch pipeline. Uh, this is the bundle jar with all the dependencies. Uh, this is the main class. Uh, I'm using a local uh, server, OpenMI server. Here I am doing uh, uh, all patients, uh, encounters, and observations. I am downloading these from OpenMRS and then exporting them to, to the cloud. This is the batch size, which is the bundle size for, because we use the search API of Fire, we download the resources in the bundles. Uh, and you are using 20 threads. Uh, obviously, this is a single machine. So, um, I only use, the, the parallelism is only with threads. And this is the uh, GCP fire store that we just created. So let's run this and see what happens. Okay, so these are the URLs for uh, the resources that are being uploaded to to cloud. As you see, these are uh, all on, the, uh, on Google Cloud. And so you see encounters, observations, and there are probably some patients as well. So this worked fine. And let's see what we have in, in BigQuery. So now, before there was no uh, data, uh, no tables in my OpenMRS demo um, data set. Now let's reload and see what we have. Uh, in my Bashir variant project, 
Yeah, so now we have some data here, yeah. So these are the uh, SQL on fire um, schema for different uh, resources. So for example, if I go to patient, for anyone who is familiar with uh, patient fire resource, you know, this should be familiar. So this is basically, the schema is based on the, the fire uh, uh, resource. Okay, so now that we have our data in uh, BigQuery, let's actually try some queries on the SQL on fire um, schema. So this is the patient schema. Uh, let's first check that we have all the data. So this is a sample query for counting all patients. And we see there are 11 patients. If I go to MySQL for OpenMRS, yeah, I can see basically the same thing that, you know, I have 11 patients. And the reason is that I had one patient, which was myself, before I added the 10 demo, demo patients when I uh, generated the demo data. So actually, let's look at specific records. So this is the ID for... So we um, can, we can uh, skip the my next two minutes. Up to 9.45, yeah. So this Import, basically what we do here is just myself. some validation. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now that we know how to query uh, repeated fields, let's actually try something more interesting and more complex. This is based on one of the uh, sample PEPFAR metrics that uh, Alan uh, has put in this list for uh, for the um, for the first version of Analytics Engine, so it's this one that I'm trying to actually show how to calculate. So we want to see uh, patients who have been uh, in the clinic, uh, let's say over the last year or so, uh, but they 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 haven't had their uh, any medication and ARV medications over the last four weeks, for example. So, so I have tried to make it uh, a little bit more complex than it should be just to show the different features that we can do. So I have like this function here, a skill function here that is for converting uh, timestamps. And I am doing a join uh, here. So first, two, between two sub-queries. Um, so first I am, so basically I am uh, joining patient encounter and observations to to get uh, the patient, for each patient, the most uh, recent uh, um, observation that I have for them. Um, and then here in this subquery, I am going through the, uh, the, the observations and, you know, looking at the concepts, uh, that, the, the codes for those observations. And here, because this is test data, uh, I'm using, uh, I think, uh, body temperature and height, but this should be basically the A ARV medications in a, re in a real scenario. And by the way, this is another uh, test data set that I have created before. It's not exactly the one that I just uh, exported uh, through the batch pipeline, but I think I have tweaked this a little bit. This is a query from a few weeks ago that I was working on this. Um, anyway, uh, I run this query um, and yeah, and then so because like, you know, concept, these, these codings are repeated fields. I am doing the same tricks basically. So I'm, it's like a join tool to, to get access to these repeated fields. Um, and I'm saying that, you know, if there, um, the, the, uh, the code is in the, uh, med codes basically, which are those two, those two codes that uh, I have for a ARV medications. So let's run this and then see what happens. So it runs basically the two sub queries and then joins them. And so basically everything is left to be query to optimize. Um, yeah, so this is basically a list, list of uh, the patients, that like the patient are these, and then their last uh, observation and then their last uh, medication. Um, and obviously, you know, we can, uh, we can, um, try to filter out those that, are, that, that that have a medication over the last uh, four weeks and then just keep the ones that, that don't. Okay, so 
I think it's enough for uh, BigQuery. The, the point that I was trying to show here is that the data is now available in a, in a data warehouse in the fire uh, schema. And then because, because it's in the cloud and then you, you can scale to many, many uh, nodes, then regardless of how much data you have, you can actually query it pretty fast in, in a few seconds, like a query like that, you, uh, like this one, you should be able to run in a few seconds, basically. Um, but obviously we don't want everything to be on cloud. So we want to have the fun be able to run things and do things with the analytics engine on, on prem or even in a single node. Um, so now let's, let's see how we can do that. Uh, this is not complete, but I, I can show up to where we are right now. So the idea is that basically we create uh, Parquet files and Parquet is a columnar format, which is which is inspired by, by, uh, uh, by the Dremel paper uh, that Google published uh, uh, some time ago. And Dremel is actually the basis for BigQuery. So what we are basically, Parquet is an open source format of Okay, so to be respectful of the time, uh, people can watch the rest of the video. Uh, there, there is the link in the first slide. But basically what we do here is that we, we generate Parquet files uh, through the batch pipeline. And also after that, uh, there is a demo of the Debezium based streaming pipeline, again, to generate uh, Parquet files. And there are enough details in, in the video. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thank you, Bashir. That was just awesome. Uh, I'll look forward to watching that again shortly. Well, oh, can't stop it. There we go. Did you have any additional comments about future plans before we move on? Uh, probably not because we are over time. <laughs> but yeah, we are basically working. So the idea of having the data in Parquet files is to be able to use them in Spark. So it's basically like a local data warehouse or uh, an on-prem data warehouse. But basically trying to simulate what we were doing in BigQuery. Awesome. Thank you very much. And just a reminder to everyone, um, please vote for the demo of the month. Uh, I am sending around the link again here since it seems the bit.ly link uh, was not working for some people. All right, uh, moving on to the QA support team. Christine, would you like to uh, briefly summarize the recent QA support team work? Um, yes, yeah, so for, for most of our work, we've been focusing on the reference application, which you'll get to see a bit of the updates on the, under the product uh, management call, uh, sorry, the product uh, section. But for this month, we'll be focusing on um, increasing our automated test cases so that we can easen up the process of testing. So we're encouraging people to join us on Monday's design forum for that tutorial, and all are very much welcome. So um, thank you. Mine is pretty short for today. Thanks. Great, thank you, Christine. Moving on to the project management team. So uh, th this is a group of volunteers and other interested people who meet once a week on Mondays to make sure that we're stewarding and maintaining um, broad priorities across our uh, platform and reference application. So some quick updates. Uh, I'm not sure if Cliff or Sharif are present who would like to provide updates, but um, the platform 2.4 release will be ready soon. In fact, the alpha was released this month and is available for people to start uh, testing with. So we would really appreciate feedback from implementers about how it interacted with your distribution. We've been testing it uh, on our own machines, but uh, of course it's much more useful to hear from implementers. And the REF app release 2.11, which includes a variety of bug fixes, patches, and uh, some, some mod updated modules all bundled together. Um, we have updated the concept packages for the REF app on MDF Builder. So these are now accessible by any REF app server. So we would, uh, we currently have a sprint going on right now. Uh, originally we did a testing sprint. However, we are currently working on a number of blocker tickets. Uh, this the sprint will conclude at the end of next week. Actually, excuse me, it'll conclude on Monday. And we expect uh, the REF app release to be roughly uh, at the end of November, uh, sometime between the 16th and the 30th. So stay tuned and we will keep you updated. Moving over to the OCL for Open MRS squad. So uh, today I'm going to give you a live demo and we'll see how that goes. So um, some background, OCL for Open MRS, if you don't already know, is a front 
end web application that allows both custom authoring and terminology management. OCL for OpenMRS has also been called our OCL client because it calls the OCL Open Concept Labs backend as the source of truth for through the OCL API. So you may uh, you may know about the Open Concept Lab uh, global good and project that was birthed within OpenMRS. The Open Concept Lab for OpenMRS or OCL client is a new UI, all, uh, a new front end to manage this content. This has all been made possible, what you are seeing now, thanks to investment by MSF OCP, MSF France, and the OCL team themselves, OpenMRS volunteers, and uh, lots of help from partners in health as well. Our MVP that you are currently looking at was used last month by MSF for a small scale implementation in Bangladesh. And we are currently increasing the functionality to allow it to be used by larger sites and larger implementations. So what's most exciting about this that we're looking at together right now is the goal is what it unlocks for implementers. We are striving for the goal where you don't have to start your dictionary or concept management from scratch. And there's no more painful migration script management just to share your concepts across your sites. So imagine if you could build your concept dictionary once and then be able to reuse it across any implementation and share it with any organization. This is going to help us speak the same concept language and share our concept, uh, concept work. So let's dive in. Right now, what you're seeing, uh, I'll go ahead and log out, and you can all see how to uh, how to get in here. The password for our demo site, uh, which I've linked to in the slides, is just admin and admin123. You're welcome to uh, play around in there. So first of all, you can see that I arrive at a dictionaries page, and I've got my dictionaries. I can see dictionaries that are shared within my organization, and I can also see any dictionaries that have been made public. So I can, I can use and borrow and, and review the work that people are doing around the world. So going back to my dictionaries, I want to create a new dictionary for a new site that uh, say I'm managing. We're going to go ahead and call this my beta site. And I'm going to call this beta uh, description test. And um, I'm going to prefer the source CL for now. I'm going to set myself as the owner. And you know what? I'm going to go ahead and make it public because I don't mind if people see what I'm working on in this case. The primary language I'm going to use is English, but I can select a wide variety of uh, an unlimited variety of other languages as well uh, should I choose to do so. So I'm going to go ahead and create this dictionary. I just need to stop the zoom commands from popping over my cursor. So now I can see all of the details of the dictionary that I have created here. I can edit the, these details that I just created if I choose to, but what I want to do right now is look at all the concepts that I have. So I'm going to view my concepts, and as you can see, I currently don't have any. Well, let's change that. I would like to add some concepts that I've already got in mind. I'm going to import an existing concept, and I'm going to add bulk ones. Now, just imagine that I'm using a spreadsheet. Um, in fact, uh, to give to bring this even closer to home, imagine I have, I'm working on this form and I need to digitize this in an open MRS instance. So some of the sample concepts that I might use from CL are things like sputum or uh, that the patient's condition has improved since the last visit or a uh, painful throat. So let's go ahead and uh, try to bulk import those. Uh, you can uh, put quite you can put hundreds of concepts that you copy and paste from your spreadsheet in here should you choose to. I'm just going to enter three today. I'm going to click add those concepts. And as you can see, that's now done. I can see that in my beta dictionary, these three concepts have been added. And I can even view a summary and I can see that not only did those concepts get added, but so did their dependent concepts. And if I would like to see this in more detail, say if I had imported hundreds and hundreds of concepts, I might find a, a spreadsheet or CSV file easier to review. And that gets auto-generated for me, as you can see here. All right, now let's say uh, I've actually got some other concepts that I would like to add, but they're not from CL. They are from one of my own sources. Uh, let's say that I'm representing MSF OCP here for, for demo purposes. And I've got a couple other concepts that are, would be useful in this form, such as vital signs, referral destination, or whether they've been admitted. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter those MSF concepts. You can see I've changed my source up here. So let's go MSF uh, 51. 
And all right, let's go ahead and add these. And as you can see, these concepts have been added. In fact, four have been added. Let's see why. Looks like there was a dependent. Great. So now if I go to my, uh, if I go back to look at my dictionary, let's see how it's coming together. Here are all the concepts that have now been added to my dictionary. That was really fast. But there are a couple others that I think I have in my MSF um, uh, source. So I'm going to go ahead and pick them. And if I change my source here to MSF, some of the things that I need, I know I've set up before, and that's things like patient name, age, ID, and so forth. So let's go ahead and add those really quickly here. I can click on the ones that I want. And I can simply click add. And these have all been added to my dictionary. So very quickly, I've now created quite a few concepts. Now, what if I want to create a concept that doesn't already exist? I'm going to create a custom concept. And given the form, one of the questions is about cost. So let's go ahead and create a concept for cost. And I'm going to give this a very simple ID here. We'll name it cough. I can add additional details if I choose to. In this case, I'm going to choose a lowercase cough. I can add further descriptions if I would like, or additional uh, things to add, such as um, whether it's new, improved, unchanged, or worse. Or you might need this for colors related to a question you're asking, and so forth. I'll just remove that. And you can also map. So let's go ahead and map this. Uh, this is a cough one. So let's map this to the CL cough concept that's available. There it is. And I'm going to say that this is the same. I might also choose to map it to Sutum. So let's go ahead and find that one. There it is. And I'm going to say that it is an associated finding in this case. And I go ahead and submit. And voila, I have created my own concept. Now, how do I manage releasing this to my site that I want to use this dictionary? Well, I'm simply going to release a new version. I'm going to call this version number one. And I might use this field to give it a date. I might submit it here. And I'm going to go ahead and release it. Yes, I do want to make, mark that as release. Now, let's say later on, you realize that you included a concept you really wish you hadn't. Perhaps I, uh, I realized it was a great mistake to improve the middle name concept for whatever reason. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that concept. It's now gone from my head or master version, but it's still included in the previous version that I released. So how can I manage that? Well, first I'm going to create a new version. This is number two, removed problematic concept. And now I'm going to go ahead and release that second one. And I'm going to unrelease the previous one. And now if I go ahead and look at my most recently released version, I can see that middle name is no longer included. Finally, uh, what if I don't want to have to do this all again for a similar implementation that will have some differences where I'm going to need to do all of this um, again, but with some nuanced changes? Well, wouldn't it be great if I just had a source already configured and ready to go for that kind of situation? Well, here we have sources. I've got my sources organization sources, and public sources. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, create my own source if I want to. Um, and this will allow me to pull concepts from this source in the future. What's coming next in this work is we are going to be, uh, we've been adding uh, MVP plus features. The next big piece is to handle the needs for localizing concepts to my setting. For example, you saw that uh, sputum was captured a little bit differently than how I might have wanted it to be captured based on this form, such as sputum production. So I might want to use the concept, but adjust it for my case without having to completely recreate it. That's the next use case we're going to try to tackle. So things you can do. If you thought this was interesting, let us know. If your implementation site would like to try it out and share feedback with us, we are very keen to hear from you. If you are a developer and you have some React experience and you'd like to grow that experience as well as experiment more with material design, which is the style guide that we're using to uh, build this experience, then please reach out on the OCL Slack channel. Thanks for listening. Over to the fire squad. Ian, I believe you are up.
Thanks, Bryce. Uh, I'll try to keep this uh, really short. So if we can move to the next slide. The big news that we have for the fire squad this month is, of course, that we had our first release and uh, then, of course, our first bug fix release. So uh, we're but we're very excited about this. We actually have something that we feel is ready for people to actually use. And we've been seeing the uh, fire module being used to power the work uh, that the analytics engine squad is doing and some of the things that the micro front end squad is doing um, in the coming in the coming month we're looking to define what our sort of next steps are so what new resources we need to what new resources we need to support uh other workflow patterns that we might want to support um we're particularly looking at supporting the uh the fire international patient summary set of resources to make sure that we have a good baseline for what you know what we need in a clinical a clinical record, and uh, we're looking to build some support for uh, creating and editing orders via the Fire API. Um, so yeah, if you have any interest in helping out with any part any part of that, if you have ideas for things we can do, things you'd like to try out, uh, please do feel free to join our calls. We're very you know open and available for collaboration. And I think that's it. <laughs> Amazing. Well done, Ian. Uh, I'm just going to skip over that one. So if you saw something interesting today, please contact the squad or the leads of the squad with your feedback. We are welcome to join the squad. And reach out to your implementation if you would like to pilot or just let them know about any of the ideas or features that were shared today. Once again, a final reminder to vote for Demo of the Month. Uh, I guess apparently this link is not working, but we've been posting an updated link in the chat that you can use. And uh, the winner of the month will be broadly announced both on talk and likely in our blog as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our next squad showcase is November 26th uh, at, on Thursday at the same time, 2 p.m. UTC. And another reminder that our conference will be a few days after that, the next week on November 30th to December 4th. And we are so excited to see you there virtually. Thanks so much everyone for your time today and we'll look forward to see you on, seeing you online.